Good morning or good day or good evening. It's Alosha Linov and I'd love to guide you through all the projects as the stand at 2020 and the little mistakes and big mistakes that I've made and just a little overview of every single project. So here we're standing in front of a 16,000 liter Super Adobe tank. The challenges that I have experienced are, well, the main thing is the first flush, this tank, I didn't position it parallel enough and it actually fell, um, damaging the chicken wire and the chicken wire was obviously placed for the rat protection. So we put it back, I made a little box, but even now it's a little tilt, tilted. So get that thing absolutely parallel, make a little stand for it. Um, if I were to do it again, I'd probably get um, a little platform made out of cement. Maybe just throw some chicken wire and just plaster a little absolutely level platform on top of the bag. You know, put a few nails or rebars just, just to, because obviously the bag is this wide and the tank is this wide. That's the one thing. Then <clears throat> we try to waterproof it with just painting the tar. Uh, the eco tar water based uh, on the walls it didn't work first we tried to put the waterproofing into the cement that didn't work because maybe the bags they have a slight movement or something then we painted it with star it didn't work and um, the guaranteed method is there um, this uh, liquid uh, natural tar uh, whatever natural pond lining product you have uh, and we dip the cloth so we actually impregnated the cloth in the drum and then we place the cloths it's all in the course but I'm just giving you what you know just a little bit of mistakes that we've had um, otherwise it's working well this is absolutely shade there's no it's not much sun here so there's some nice shade loving plants here so this bed is doing really well um, yeah, it's, it's a really nice project. Why I said if I had to do it again, we're actually selling this house at the moment, um, moving to Russia and to develop cold climate um, eco homes based on airship and uh, geothermal heat and many other things. Um, I'm sure you've been seeing some of the models of T7 and T8. So that's, that's why I said to, from, to do it again. Uh, or if you were to do it, that's what you would uh, want to do. Otherwise, the tank is working well. Um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really happy with it. Uh, the, 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 the net on top, the shade net on top, also acts as a nice, uh, you know, screen for any leaves that are falling in. So it's actually just as I spoke in theory, the tank is performing super. So whilst we're here, let's talk about a little bit about harvesting. Um, so we've got to the first flush. Um, and behind there you can see the gutter and the gutter I'm actually catching water off the grass roof and it's the worst type of roof to catch water so because lots of pieces come in so what I've done is I made uh, those socks that you can see out of shade cloth uh, which I dressed the uh, gutters in and they catch all the bits and pieces otherwise the gutters are just full of uh, natural material um, um, yeah organic material what I'm finding the water that's collecting is uh, not very good, uh, obviously not suitable for drinking because of the grass roof. So I've probably done the craziest thing. So there's a little project that I'll just show you around the corner. will allow the water to circulate. So what I have on top here is part of a food grower that I'm, you know, <laughs> that it was uh, originally designed for. So inside basically you've got um, it's not launched yet for here but basically I'm going to get a two meter pump and I'm going to create a wetland up there and going to circulate this water up and around with the flow to take the natural material <clears throat> the organic material and the water out um, because obviously as I said the water is just you know, it's really terrible quality um, because of uh, um, the grass roof so the wetland and the pump will circulate the water it's obviously a super additional feature you do not need to do it if you have a normal roof that doesn't have organic matter but in my case what i'm going to do is so have the pump circulating and have um you know the wetland um, inside so i've created a little wall and a spiral i mean it doesn't look that great now but nevertheless i'll, I'll show it to you so uh, there is a little spiral 
yeah, which allow the water to be guided. This is just a little wall that I've created. I've glued it together with the tar cloth. Harvesting water off the ground. So here's some of the pipes that were made. <clears throat> Basically, it's a good project. It sends water, sends water to four different locations from this pavement. Um, and just overall, I don't want to speak about this, just harvesting water off the ground has been phenomenal. The main key thing that you need to look out for is when it rains really hard, you need to go outside and actually observe where the water flows. Because where you've got biggest erosion, biggest gullies, biggest flow of water, that's where you want to start your either earthworks or uh, some other permaculture systems where you can divert the water. Um, so generally harvesting water off the ground is one of the best and easiest ways to soak in and impregnate our earth with um, the water that comes from the sky. Key point here, put terrace your lands obviously or create berms, swales and uh, if you're in a small space create pathways. Um, or little stepping stones where you walk and other spaces are mulched, 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 mulched. So it creates a living sponge that absorbs and is not compressed. So you're walking where you've designated yourself to walk with little stones and bricks or stepping stones, pathways and everywhere else is just mulched and, um, you know, rejuvenated and creating a living sponge. Just like this. Look at the thickness of that mulch. Those plants are going to be very, very happy. The rain came, now all that water is going to lock in there. Without this mulch, I've lost half the plants. Here I have a ferro cement tank behind me. One of the first projects we built on the land. The only thing I'd say is different, this dome roof is just a headache. <laughs> really. Um, I'd probably make it out of bricks if you really want domes. But uh, a cone roof, like explained in the harvesting of water manual, which is, you know, in this chapter, from Caminos de Agua, our friends from Mexico, harvesting water. It's a whole beautiful manual that they typed out with diagrams. So I'm actually referring you, it's no better way to explain. I've got the video lessons, obviously, for how we've done this, but please watch the Ma read the manual that they've typed out because all the parts, all the step-by-step -step instructions, pictures, they're all in there. Once you watch, read that and you watch our videos, you're going to have a very good understanding how to build a tank that's twice the size uh, for a third of the price of the plastic tank with a sump that gets the water to the lowest point and of course ferro cement making it last a hundred years plus so it's a really good project and the roof is just a coned roof. I know it may seem a little simple, but it's very much, much, much easier to make a cone roof than to try and get a dome roof going. That's the only thing I'd say. Otherwise, the project is fantastic. And with Caminos de Agua harvesting manual and my video lessons, you're going to get a very, very holistic and complete understanding on how to build a 12,000 liter water tank. This is just 6,000 liters. I'm currently not using it yet, haven't waterproofed it, but as I said, it's linked to the biochar filter. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that will feed this filter. And this tank needs to be next to a roof that gets the water from the roof, of course. And I don't have a roof in a facility here. Um, but, you know, I just build it for the lesson to show you. It could be now used as an aquaculture system or something else. Um, but obviously it's designed as a, a, a water tank. Uh, a quickest, easiest way to get yourself uh, some really proper big water. Like 12,000 liters of water is a five-day project. A few friends. Uh, really, really nice project. Uh, highly recommend it. Yeah. Below this dome is an underground water tank. Um, to tell you the truth, I haven't still got to plastering it. I have built it, it's standing there. So the first mistake is the groundwater. Mm, you have to check at 
you do a pilot hole, you dig a little hole, and at the highest level of when you have a rainy season, how high does that groundwater come? Because what I found is um, if you're going to do this as a cellar, you're going to have moisture coming in constantly because if the groundwater level is, you know, let's say uh, five feet before below the so the, the ground and the, the, the top of the, the, the surface and you've got, uh, let's say, um, 10 foot deep cellar, then you're going to have constantly water. Yes, you can do some forms of diversions and things to move the water away, but still if the groundwater is high, groundwater is high. So if you want to make this into um, uh, uh, an underground cellar, which, you know, I'm not going to explain now, but basically some of the ideas that you obviously divert the water away with French drains, um, then you want to be raising the floor above the groundwater level and uh, seal the whole space up. Um, so, you, like at least a, a damp course, like a plastic over the whole bottom, coming up the walls, plastered in so you don't have the water seeping up. Um, obviously do the space on the bags where you wrap your bags like we did the sandbag house so you don't have the wicking action going up the walls si uh, that siphoning wicking action um, but in this case it's the underground water tank so the water the first mistake we made is we dug the hole we didn't do the bags yet and then I left it for nine months and when the rain came the wall collapsed um, so that was terrible and um, but otherwise Everything went up, we did the whole cylinder with bags, a beam went phenomenal, then we did a little ferro cement uh, roof and then we put that dome on top, uh, flooring and then the dome on top of this. So I'd say that's pretty good. Um, the, the entrance to this uh, space, I would, um, you'll see when I do the, the rebars for the ferro cement roof of the underground water tank, we came a bit too close, you know, we, we, we weaved them and they created like a funny little entranceway that is very small. What I would do is when those weaves come through, I would connect a ring first. Make a metal ring out of rebar, let's say, you know, a nice size of a, you know, what if you pick up some weight? <laughs> you know, let's say three, three, uh, two and a half feet, foot, yeah, nice little ring and then you when you weave your rebars, you actually weave to the ring, you know, around, and then you have this ring that will basically keep that nice entrance. You'll have a nice manhole wood that go up and down. Um, but that that would be the only mistake that we've made because our entrance is very small, especially a person like myself can only get in. Nobody else can get in and maintain. And now that we've closed it, we're in a rush. We haven't plastered it. So now to plaster it, we have to open this wooden entrance. I'll show you now. And, you know, get in there and um, send buckets down and plaster it, which will be quite something. The dome is in renovation, so excuse the vibe. We are going to be plast not plastering, making the walls nice and um, high quality and neat. But here what I wanted to show you, this is the wooden, this is the wooden entrance. So the only thing I would do here is I'd put um, like a, even a thick cardboard or something like um, around when you plaster the floor to the wood. Because when you remove this plastic, then the wood will be loose. We didn't do that, so the wood is really hard to get out of. So I need to either make the wood smaller now, or but I haven't worked on it. It's, the underground water tank is here, but to tell you honestly, I haven't even got to it. Just finance-wise, um, time-wise, just haven't got to just too many projects. You know, obviously I've got my water that's coming in from the other water tanks, so. Um, I haven't had the need for this, but uh, this is a really awesome puppy and it can hold 40 cubic meters, 40,000 liters of water. So it's sitting right here underneath my feet. Alright, so the pool <laughs> and the wetlands. 
Wow, there's quite a lot to sell. So, in this module, you're going to see quite a few lessons that says like mistakes in correct implementation. So what we've done is, behind me in the middle is this huge papyrus. Right there they are, just below the sun. This huge papyrus, that was the wetland number one, which I've used an earthship, grey water wetland system, where the water drops in, and travels through the gravel, comes around, and then it overflows back into the pool. That did not work. The one biggest mistake I made, I cut the liner too short because when the, I didn't accommodate for the water, for the gravel having resistance um, against, uh, yeah, it was the water. And basically, although it was maybe 10 inches or eight inches the overflow was eight inches lower than where I cut the gravel, but because of the resistance of, I mean, where I cut the liner, because of the resistance of the water with the gravel, the water just overflowed over the edges. So that was a huge mistake. Um, it was just, God, this is happy. So I really should have ran the system first before cutting it. Um, the, and the biggest mistake I've made is that I didn't research how to do a proper pool wetland. I thought any wetland could work for a pool uh, or, you know, any wetland could work for treatment of water. No, there's a thing with grey water, it travels slowly and that wetland, like Mike Reynolds' design, is perfect. Grey water that gets released and travels slowly. With a pool, you get this high flow, low pressure pumps, which basically is this wetland. Um, but before, I'll just explain to you. But just now but basically it flows a lot of water 20,000 30,000 40,000 liters an hour okay so it's a completely different system I'll show it to you now then I build the second wetland wetland number two which is this beautiful thing on the left hand side which is right now used when I top up the pool from the super adobe sandbag tank that catches the water off my grass roof you remember the water is a bit funky because of the grass it's a grass roof so the water is really terrible so what i do is i push is that black pipe maybe you can see and that pushes the water to the first uh part of the wetland number two it goes to second third so how that wetland works is i've made <coughs> two two drainage pipes first it was two five uh, two uh, two inch pipes and with lots of holes and cloth and then the roots just <laughs> and then the first wetland started overflowing because I've made another mistake I've made two divisions so there's three little wetland cells in there um, and basically as soon as that the water gets choked uh, but the roots choke uh, the two inch pipe the first wetland starts overflowing okay so uh, the main mistake I made there is um, again I tried to push the water through the pump. So I've had a, in, in here, um, I had a solar pump that I just, you know, like a borehole pump for to suck water from underground. I just placed it in a pool. It does 7,000 liters an hour, I think, and just connected with a panel and, a, you know, it was doing its thing and it was pushing the water through that wetland. But um, as I said, because I made two divisions, when what I should have done is, did not ha shouldn't have divisions and the water should just flow through and this wetland is maybe good for like an aquaculture system and I'm not an aquaculture expert so but th there is space for it so basically what I've done is the water would get in into this uh, uh, first wetland and it would overflow the first part and then it would get into a, a, a four inch elbow that would go into the second wetland split into two drain X pipes and I've changed them to two drain X pipes also in cloth and then, um, you know, uh, would, that would overflow and it goes to a third wetland and it's all in the course, you'll see it. Um, and then it would go into another drainage and then it would, there's two little white uh, things here, yeah? And then the water would overflow into the pool. If I were to do that system again, not for the pool, but for possibly an aquaculture system, I would not have the divisions. Because the divisions make, as soon as the first wetland overflows, the first cell overflows then you're losing water so i would um, not have any divisions i'd have the water just going straight into the two drain x pipes and they would basically sit under the gravel it's filled with gravel and the roots you know that do, do this thing um 
it comes up and uh, you know it overflows into whatever but uh, I don't know what that wetland is good for so you, you need to look at these systems and you can get ideas and maybe try a little experimentation things possibly an aquaculture system but you know I'm not an expert in aquaculture and I'd love to be an, you know an expert one day I'll take a course from uh, some of the good teachers out there but the wetland number three is the one that I really want to share with you this is this guy on my um, right your left <laughs> yeah so basically what it works the water overflows in, from the pool through these, these big holes like four inch holes the first mistake I made I made them those two inch holes didn't work so for this size pull three four inch holes giant eh? okay for your smaller pool at least two do not go less than two um, because you talk about 30,000 liters an hour pump it really yeah so what we've done is basically this is the professional this is how professionals build wetland conversions for pool conversions for natural pools so the water overflows from the pool into the wetland the wetland in turn collect gravity gravity feeds all that water basically drops down remember wetland number one I push the water through the gravel. Wetland number two, I push the water through uh, through the pump with, with the two pipes and gravel. Wetland number three, the pool overflows into the wetland. The water falls down naturally with gravity. And then a complex network of pipe collects that water from the whole bottom to one point into the pump and throws it back into the pool. This is the little pipes that you keep on seeing that flow the water back into the pool. So that's what is happening. So the water drops into the pool, mixes with the pool water, and then goes back in. I was still struggling with it, but then eventually I decided to put two UV lights. And that just did magic. I mean, I, I can drink the water from my pool. It's really, really tasty. I, I just, this is the water I treat with the biochar filter. And uh, it's amazing to swim. The birds love it. The birds are building from papyruses, beautiful nests. Um, there's other birds appearing here. So this wetland really added an amazing feature to the garden. So three wetlands later, lots of money spent, lots of mistakes. This is the guy. You want to be making wetland number three. And that's why wetland number three is in the first, uh, um, you know, I've placed it in the first uh, part of the pool conversion a wet number two and the wet number one are sitting at the end and you can just watch it when you want to deepen your knowledge and see some of the mistakes I've made um, I've left it there because you know I had my logic so and you might have the same logic so maybe those things will spark some ideas or maybe uh, those the um, videos will uh, help you avoid some of the mistakes you might make you know um, we are breaking through I mean there are some wizards like such as John Todd uh, who are paving the way with water treatment technology uh, which we have learned from but still this is very pioneering for us to use pumps and water and plants it's you know became available only in the last few years for majority of the population you know before that uh, the pumps were only available for you know, you know it was the elites who could have them i'm sure and uh, yeah it just wasn't available to the general public so this knowledge of treating water with plants like that and uh, replicating nature and biomimicry has really been available to us only in the last few years but it's 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 marvelous i swim in the water every day three four times a day um it's really refreshing there's no chlorine um and the living ecosystem just pumps so behind me is one of the biochar filters we have two on the property um biochar filters really been working well we are drinking water from it um, and um, for the big home of the city i find that 300 liters here is not enough so if i were to do design the system again uh, for a family of let's say four people 
I would go for a bigger system or, you know, create multiple of these systems. But um, a 2000 liter system, you basically have a guarantee that um, when you have the pump, it's in the course, the, the pressurizing of the filtered water to the house. When you have the pump, it, it, it has 2000 liters a day that it uh, can deliver. So if one person has a bath, 200 liters, uh, two 100 liter ha uh, showers, um, you know, yeah, so let's say a thousand liters a day, which is still quite a lot. It depends if you have, you know, good access to water. Um, and, you know, but obviously if you're in a desert, this is perfect, 300 liters a day, or, or this is what the system can produce. And, um, you know, it would be perfect for, when we move to a small home, I'd say that's, that's really good. Maybe, you know, you split your shower. Some people have a shower in the morning, some people have a shower in the, in the evening. And this system is enough because you remember, you're recycling all the water like up to six, seven times. So this is just perfect for, uh, let's say a family of three people, um, you know, but in a city scenario, like where I'm getting this house ready for sale or before I was trying to build an eco center here, you know, that just wouldn't be enough. So the problem with that is the pump that takes this water, pressurizes it to the house. Um, the, the water would run out and the pump can run dry and, you know, just uh, burn out. So otherwise the biochar filter works really great. Um, I've tested the vortex pipe uh, with the seashells that was going really well with the, another pump to circulate that and activate the water. Um, right now I'm not using it as I move the pipe, pipe out of here. But otherwise the biochar filter is fantastic. Remember after three years you need to um, redo the biochar or at least once a year test the water so the water quality is still good so here's a biochar filter that we are using on a daily basis it's got a tap we had the water tested so what i have actually is i have the pool water coming up to um but when i switch on the barracuda the thing that jumps i have that water coming in because this water tank is not yet waterproofed so that but that is linked already, connected to feed the biochar filter. So as soon as that gets waterproof, the biochar filter will get water from the tank. But um, obviously for the purpose of the training, <laughs> I build it there and to show you, but you know, I don't have a roof nearby. So that's another thing, you know, you need to build a tank near the roof, but we'll speak about the tank separately. But the biochar filter works marvelous. I actually didn't do mistakes on it. It's, it's, it's really, it's going well. Um, the pool pushes water all the way and feeds it. The water is still really good quality. I'm enjoying it. We've ran a pipe outside of the gate. You've seen it in one of the YouTube videos. So some of the people that come around the street, there's drinking water to enjoy. Here's the gray water. <clears throat> so what do we have is we've got the pipes that are coming off from our bath and kit, uh, shower. Um, and they go through into the wetland so the main main problem with the wetland is the outlet should be at least three inch or four inch that takes it to um to the sump where i was sitting with the pump um because with a two inch overflow i just don't feel like the water can escape fast enough that's the first thing. The second thing, I would make sure that that overflow is at least one foot below the top of the vessels. Because what's happening now, and I've got to be honest with you, you know, the, you know I'm not going to give you a, a, a pretty picture of, uh, you know, that everything is hunky-dory. Because I didn't do the one foot o um, below above, so what happens is now that the out overflow it has a four inch pipe that goes down you remember you'll see it in the course it's got lots of holes a cloth for the roots not to throttle it and then that water goes out so first of all the o outlet overflow should be also a can connected with rocks so lots of rocks on the outflow with the cloth so the fabric uh, with the fabric so the water can just you know get into the big rocks and then be pulled out with uh, with not pulled out but then got up the four inch pipe I didn't do that so all the roots basically choke this pipe don't allow 
you know, the roots just go mad there. <laughs> it was grey water. So they don't, they choke this whole pipe up, they cover it up, and basically what happens is the water can't escape fast enough. And because the water can't escape fast enough, then it overflows over the sides. So you drain your bath or your shower, the water comes up, can't escape, and drains over the sides. And then it started creating mold in my house. So what I've done now is I temporarily redirected that water to go straight from the bath to the sump, which basically goes straight because we're using natural soap, so that goes straight to landscape for now. But I'm going to redo this wetland, basically pull out all the plants. I'm going to put new tanks up on top of these uh, because, you know, I don't want to dig these out and um, basically redo them with the rock entrance is perfect, like you see it in the, in, the, in the free webinar and in the course. But then the exit should also have the same rocks, which, uh, you know, allow the water to basically... The rocks, they're like... Because of their big gaps, they just, they just go there and there's lots of water and the water can escape. So, the main thing is that the roots are throttling the exit of the water. You can go away, get away with a two inch outlet if you have at least a foot above um, that. So you have, you know, quite a lot of water can, so should you drain your bath, the water can drain, uh, you know, back up and then go through. The other thing I would add, look, my cranial system is a huge wetland. We're talking about a 30 foot wetland. Of course, it doesn't have any overflow issues. It's properly designed. It's all there. But we're trying to do the same thing with one IBC drum. drum. So we take a square cage, we split it in half, and that's why we're having these issues of uh, the, there's just too much water. So if we are too much water for these two little drums, you know, split in half, I would still go for a full size drum for the wetland because of the one foot over, uh, one foot you need to be above the overflow pipe. Yeah? So because of one foot, even one and a half foot, then you're already losing that, that because that's going to be all, um, you know, uh, it's just going to be for the backup of water. The other thing I would do is I would have a 40 gallon, 50 gallon, those blue drums, plastic blue drums. I would have that as a first thing. So when the water from the bath drains, boom, you know, 50 gallons, boom, one time, quick drops into this blue drum and then the blue drum you've got a a, a, a a regulate like a little tap that you regulate so because you want to slow the water down so it trickles slowly but if you do a trickle slowly through the wetland it's basically gonna back up because it, you know the only way you can trickle the wetland slowly is to make the exit too small and that's gonna back up and overflow so what I would do is have a, two, uh, a 200 litre, 50 gallon drum first. And that's just empty, the water comes in and at the bottom it trickles out slowly for maybe the next half an hour. Yeah? Trickles slowly. The overflow from that blue drum I would have go straight to the wetland or to your landscape. So should somebody have a bath and then somebody has another bath 10 minutes later, which shouldn't be the case, then, you know, at least it's not overflowing f through the drum. So you always plan for the overflow. It's one of the key permaculture principles. Um, <clears throat> but so basically we drained our whole bath or shower into this drum quickly. And then the drum with a smaller pipe gets that water slowly through the wetland. And then you can get away with a two inch overflow because the inlet is in the one inch let's say or uh, less than one inch uh, or three quarter inch and the outer is two inch but still make sure that you design that your outlet pipe which is goes down to collect the water from the bottom of the drum with lots of holes that's also in a rockery container maybe it could be even um, uh, uh, um, a smaller drum that you stack stick at the bottom that is also full of holes with cloth that just gets the water in there or maybe even has some mesh um, but yeah your main thing is the roots so when I'll be doing this wetland for the fourth time 
you know, re not redoing it, but doing next one, the fourth uh, uh, wetland of this type in the IBC square drum. I'll record it and I'll show you what I mean and I'll, of course I'll add it to the course and put it on YouTube um, because it's very important that we can get our water clean. But as you can see, there is the sewage pipe going through. Um, there is the grey water pipes going through. But obviously in America or these fancy countries, you'd have all of that in the walls, which is a problem. So that's why we need to, you know, and because of the temperature as well, like Russia, I can't have pipes exposed like that. And they'll freeze and burst. So all of that has to be really thought and uh, but the main thing to remember, keep your water as high as possible. So your grey water coming out of your sink um, or your, your, your bath, uh, keep it as high as possible because then you can channel to your wetland at 3 degrees, 3 centimeters over a uh, 100 centimeter drop. 3 degree drop, you can take the water out. So what I mean is, if you're inside the house and you have, let's say, uh, um, a sink that's grey water, not kitchen water, but grey water. Um, don't drop the pipe in the house low and then come out low. Come out out of the house as high as possible and then you can take that water further away from your house and irrigate more of your landscape. So that's the only thing to remember uh, with that. But it's all in the course, everything is there. I just wanted to give you an overview, but otherwise it's a jungle. It's a jungle full of plants and it's been really performing exceptionally well. It's one of the first projects I've built, but after four years of operation, I'm finding that the water is not escaping fast enough because the roots have choked up, um, you know, the, out, the outlet. Um, and when you see what I mean, you, you'll understand what I mean by the outlet. And uh, so here is the sun where my pump sits about maybe five feet lower. Um, basically the water from the wetland overflows and goes into the sump and when the float switch comes up kicks in and irrigates the garden so that's been working really well um, the only recommendation I would do I wouldn't do any sprinklers only drip irrigation under mulch directed to your plants um, because obviously with a thick layer of mulch we're doing permaculture you're just wetting the top of the grass yes the leaves enjoy a bit of water but um, I would do all the irrigation drip under mulch oh, and behind me you see that uh, silver drum that's the toilet flush I just got to speak of the mistake there so basically in my sump where I was sitting there is a pump and the pump takes that water fast when the you know it's quite powerful pump and it irrigates the whole garden and, and it also sends the water to this drum. So the first mistake I made is I have just um, put the lid on and then when the water came up, it was high pressure, it burst the lid, the lid cracked. So what I've done now is I've created a um, little air, a little air, 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 air gap uh, and then um, I've put in a tank connector there, very important, because when I didn't put the tank connector through the air gap, water came up, poof, cracked the lid again. So you put the little air gap, maybe a half inch, and then you put a tank connector, which is that rubber seal, makes it nice and strong, and that when the water comes up, you know, obviously the pump doesn't know that this drum is full, because you know there's no sensors there, so the water just overflows back into the wetland from the top, and when the garden is irrigated, the sump is empty, the pump is drained it, then it stops. And then this guy is full. And then that, that goes to the toilet. And that's been working really well. Um, obviously, the only challenge is you need to size it correctly. So see how many flushes you do. Uh, because basically, if you don't shower, you don't have water going up there. And then you've got no, no water to flush your toilet with. So that's the only thing to consider. Um, but it otherwise it has been working really well here's a biogas digester that sits underneath me and there's the wetland that takes the water to the you know through earthship uh, earthship botanical cell style I've got my gas pipe I need to get another stove you get special stoves that have bigger holes or you can drill the holes in the nozzle bigger yourself hear the sound 
yeah it's coming through but because of the nozzle size the fire is not burning obviously you saw me with a pipe I can get the fire to go out from the pipe but not yet from the stove um, as an overall biogas digester project is pretty good let me take the camera back so you can see the wetland yeah so just behind me is the wetland which basically treats the water for the uh, sewage there's no serious mistakes I've made here yeah the biogas digester project is pretty clean it's pretty clean so obviously a couple of mistakes I've put there in the course but as an overall um, biogas digester is working well obviously my gas pipe is quite far from the house so it have to be some garden cooking um, which is perfect once we you know design the space in nature so a bit of gas cooking a bit of solar cooking a bit of dehydration with sun you know um, and then of course some board gas or, or whatever you have uh, to substitute when you don't have you know when you run out of um, biogas otherwise the project is working really well um, I'll show you the network the complex network of pipes <laughs> that I've designed for the sewage and uh, it's not too complex but obviously if your pipes are hidden in America or then it's really hard to get them so uh, through this complex network of pipes you'll see how the whole thing works um, but as a as a overall biogas digester project is uh, phenomenal so check it out it's all in the training below and um, yeah the wetland is again so there's two wetlands here let me just step out of the way so that's that's so all of these are water plants this just runs 14 meters yeah there and there is the wetland for the pool so behind me is the grease trap let's go have a look at it so basically what we have here is a net that catches the stuff that I clean out maybe once to three weeks and uh, a little plate that keeps the fats to the side. Now that I opened it's got a bit of smell but when the grease trap is closed there is no smell whatsoever. The kitchen water basically comes in, just drops in there. I've got a valve here, a valve that I can open so if I ever want to have that water go straight to the drain, I can. But in an our eco home scenario, we'll never go let it go straight to the drain. Unless, for example, we are draining some harsh, harsh chemicals or washing the paint brushes, you know, then you might have a drain scenario. But even in an eco home, the drain will be in the lines of uh, maybe some form of a sand filter that doesn't, you know, that filters out the paints and doesn't allow to damage the groundwater. So that's the grease trap, really cool project, a uh, really simple project, just gravity feed straight to landscape. Here I am sitting on top of the trench that takes the water from the kitchen, from the grease trap. The kitchen water goes separate into this trench, it's basically, um, it's about 15 feet long, maybe one foot by one foot, yeah. Um, and I've just, basically it's level, from counter line it's level and uh, it's filled with lots of sticks uh, and at the bottom it has a two inch pipe black pipe with holes cut out at five o'clock and seven o'clock 10 millimeter holes so half inch holes at five o'clock and seven o'clock if you do the holes at the bottom they get stuck if you do the holes from the top stuff will fall in so that five o'clock and seven o'clock the pipe is lying here that takes the water from the grease trap. The grease trap stops the bits and pieces from going into this pipe and the fats from going into this pipe. And this pipe is lying at the bottom of this trench right underneath me. The trench is quite loose, quite springy. It's filled with loose material, no soil. And on top of it I've just put some grass and uh, you can put some stepping stones on top of it or put bigger sto stepping stones so you can still utilize that as a walking pathway. And basically what happens is underground it feeds all of these vegetables and herbs passively every time I release kitchen water providing there's no harsh harsh chemicals um, it just feeds the garden constantly underground it feeds the garden all the time because that's downslope so that's kitchen water to landscape really easy really fun project um, it will take your day um, cool project to start with
So here is a terrace project. Um, I'd say I'm pretty chuffed with it. Um, no mistakes. The only thing I would say is if you're planning some piping, make sure you accommodate, uh, or even if you think you're gonna have some piping, just put in you know, a little sleeve, like it could be a two inch pipe, just when you build with Super Adobe, you put it in and just leave it there, you know. So when you need to put in a pipe, that's it could be some irrigation, you don't have to bash through the walls of the terraces uh, because it's quite something with a drill bit once it hardens. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. As you saw, you use uh, an, a pick and you use the geometry of your hand to draw it. When you've got the curve this way, you draw this way. When you've got the curve going that way, you know, you do the same thing. And that's how you get all the beautiful flow forms. Um, I'd get uh, a little bit of a plan, obviously, on paper before, so you know how far you're getting the curves of, let's say, you know, just a little bit of a plan, the distances. So, you know, if you're using on checkered paper, two centimeters could be two meters. So, you know, oh, okay, you put like little markers. You know, so that's two meters off the wall. Yeah, but otherwise, uh, the really terraces are amazing. Uh, they, we've put bricks, uh, little bricks where we walk. Yeah, we try and step on those, and everywhere else is this living matter with, um, yeah, that doesn't get compressed. Um, there's my little permaculture system that I've made with the water going in four different directions. Um, feeding some of the beds yeah look at the beautiful terraces some flowers there's always been planting amazing here yeah. yeah so they they're juicy they're juicy they're mulched just had some rain they've actually gone a bit wild <laughs> I'd say happy with the terraces project Okay, so project wall, insane, too big, <laughs> very big, uh, very strong. I had to do strong because of the river uh, flooding my garden, so it's really tank proof. The pockets are phenomenal. I'm keep making compost in one, keeping mulch in another, slept in the third one, uh, keeping some uh, planting seedling trays in the fourth one. Uh, they're really, really great. So pockets have served a great purpose of hiding some of that permaculture uh, muck that uh, <laughs> a typical permaculture would gather you know for the others they seem like rubbish but for other people it's actually a uh, very useful material so if you don't have a river uh, that you need to protect yourself away I'd say you could go with a 40 centimeter bag uh, flattened 40 centimeter it's more than enough I went for about 60 uh, yeah what else do we have? Um, if you want to do some cool things such as a uh, little fire pit here and two pipes with a coil so you can make this into a bath, then plan your pipes that go into the wall. Once again, have the little two inch, um, and just stick some pipes in so you could, you know, utilize this as a, a, a bath or to drain water out of for a bath or like a little uh, heating uh, pond uh, with a fire as I said like if you have two pipes and a coil here metal coil you make a fire here this would be a great nice hot soak but again that would need a, a drain hole with a, a slanted floor with a sump and to take the water out and it would have to have two pipes in drilling through this right now is pff, is ridiculous because you not only need to drill to open up a hole this size you need to bash with a metal bar and that just takes a long time so as you're building any of the super adobe even if you think you might have a pipe there or even if you don't think you're gonna have a pipe there just stick in some extra you know uh, two inch uh, off cuts of pipes that you can utilize in the future that's the only thing I suggest otherwise project went really well uh, lots of manpower very expensive uh, would be I mean, $4,000 for me in South Africa, but uh, you can triple that anywhere else. Um, but as I said, I went for a very thick wall. Um, you know, let's check it on the outside.
Yeah, I've placed the old fence up on top here with some barbed wire and some mulch. Guys, yeah, this is a good project. Whilst I'm here, I'd like to show to you the, the little wormery system that I've made. And basically, what we have here is half of the 1000 liter IBC white tank, the caged one. So it's half was a cloth, uh, so it's about gravel stones. Uh, four inches then a cloth it's slightly placed at an angle so all the liquid can drain out Jeff Lawton suggests to put um, uh, like a drain X uh, pipe perforated pipe all the way to the bottom so the worms get a bit of air but I found that's not necessary uh, my neighbors grass clippings are going here um, cardboard eggs perf perfect so you know I'll, I'll, I just threw it in here but you, you know, obviously you'll dig it in but let me show you the magic that happens with the worms so obviously no citrus, no onion, no meat, no fish, uh, yeah, no oily salty foods like that, but done fast. I I'll show you how it works, you just basically all the scraps uh, go in here, except onion and you know meat, fish and uh, um, citrus. And those other things go somewhere else, I'll show you. So yeah, really good soil. Tons of worms, tons, tons of worms. Uh, and they're just eating compost and they're shitting out <laughs> soil. That's really what they do. They, t they eat grass clippings. You just can feed them grass clippings. They eat grass clippings and they shit out most amazing uh, soil that doesn't smell. And the the... The grass, the, the lawn from my neighbor, makes it into a natural filter that there is no smell. As you can see, my lounge is right here, the window is right here, and this compost pile is right here. I mean, it's not a compost pile, it's a worm bath. And because of the grass, there is no smell at all. Here is a little space to get the worm, the worm tea that comes up from the worm bath so which you can put on any plants basically got some worm casting here yeah from the worms and then the little mesh I had there for the rats they just keep on attacking and eating stuff out of the compost so I would make a little cage like a little lid here with that mesh to stop the rats from getting access. Oh, and I wanted to show you the red worms versus white worms. Okay, so let me show you quickly how composting works. Okay, this is incorrect, sorry. I need to explain to my family. So, um, we've got the red worms. That's basically everything to do with kitchen scraps, yeah? Um, no citrus, no onion, no meat, no fish. Citrus and onion um, and fish things and egg things like rotten eggs all go in here and here we have white worms. Muggets. Yeah? And that gets basically dug a hole in the garden uh, with dog poo and that gets covered in there and you just place a lid and when that thing is full you cover it with soil and that turns into amazing compost. Eggs get pushed down, crushed with a brick and that can be spread for roses and other beautiful things to add calcium so that's the stuff that goes to our worm bath that's the stuff that goes into the garden with dog poo and that's the stuff that gets crushed and adds calcium into the garden so that's recycling really easy no smell A little timer. Nine o'clock. Boom.
So thank you for taking this tour around our garden, um, which we are selling. So if any of you are interested in purchasing it, I was developing it as a permaculture school, but circumstances has turned for us that we have decided to leave South Africa and relocate to Russia. So this place is now up for sale and we're just doing some final touches. Um, yeah, and we'll do a much better system that's replicated in Russia and it will be debt free because we're not going to use the bank to get the mortgage. So that's the biggest thing that's been actually killing us here is uh, having this mortgage that's suddenly they've placed an extra $2,000 extra fees last year which they didn't explain because I didn't pay place the fees that wanted to put the house in auction again so I, you know they still haven't explained to me where the fees came from but that's a separate story what I wanted to say today is thank you for taking this little tour I have basically recorded the each project which I will put into the training as a little overview of each of the projects in the BiBet Academy. So if you are interested in purchasing the training, the link is below, buybetter.co abundance forward slash abundance of water. Check it out, recommend it to friends. Um, yeah, and I look forward to be seeing you inside of our digital classroom. Otherwise, for all our subscribers and students, thank you for all your support. It's been just phenomenal. And uh, Zoe and I are going full power. And my son has joined me and we're relocating to Russia within six weeks, permanently. Boom.